Hello again. Uh, so in this week's lecture, um, we're going to cover um, shockwave analysis, which is one of the fundamental um, tools in traffic engineering. Let's start with definition of the shockwave. What is a shockwave? Um, so shockwave is actually defined as the transition between two steady state traffic conditions. For example, um, um, a transition from free flow speed to a complete stop uh, can be a shockwave. Uh, the complete stop could be due to an accident or due to a traffic signal. But because we see a transition from free flow stop, free flow speed to that complete stop, that transition is uh, considered as a shockwave. Or it doesn't have to be a full stop or going from free flow speed uh, to complete a stop. It could be just moving from somewhere in the uncongested regime near capacity to the congested regime. So any transition from two, from one steady state traffic condition to another steady state traffic condition is actually shockwave. So here is an example. Uh, so these are some uh, real trajectories as you've seen before. Uh, so all these trajectories that you see in this time and space diagram is obtained from uh, video footages of a US highway. Uh, I, I guess that's US 101 highway in California. Um, and as you can see, um, multiple shockwaves um, have formed over time uh, in this example. Uh, we'll talk more about why uh, these shockwaves form and different kind of shockwaves that we have, but I wanted to show you how these shockwaves usually look like um, when we look at the time and space diagram. So you will easily identify it. So in most cases, it's easy to identify them um, by just looking at the trajectory. So the wave you see that moves um, in, the, in the time and space diagram um, uh, are the shock waves uh, at, um, are the shock waves themselves? So here is another example of uh, shock wave formation. Um, imagine a signalized intersection. Um, so sorry about the drawings on the PDF. Um, this meant to be clean before I start the lecture, but this was from my studying this morning. So anyways, so this is a time and space diagram on the right, and here we have a traffic signal. So as long as the light is green for this period of time, you see that vehicle trajectories are just moving without necessarily the need to slowing down, right? So the capacity is large when we have the green phase. But as soon as so let's from let's say T0 to T1. But as soon as the traffic light becomes red and it remains red until T2, let's say, um, vehicles have to stop, right? Like a complete stand is still a stop. So this vehicle uh, is not lucky enough to pass the green. So it hits the red light, it has to stop. So the vehicle trajectory goes horizontal. And then when the red light again turns to green, it speeds up and then it continues. So the vehicle behind that lead vehicle also has to break down because the vehicle front has uh, stopped. So this vehicle stops, this, the next vehicle also has to stop. And we can actually see here that a shock wave starts forming here. Same thing happens when a star vehicles, so shock waves do not necessarily just form when vehicles stop. When vehicle also start to accelerating and moving, another shock wave could form. So in this case, this vehicle starts accelerating and moving uh, and moving ahead because the, the traffic light has turned from red to green at time T2. And then the vehicle behind is also accelerating and moving up and this one is, as well. So we can actually see another shock wave is actually forming here. Again, remember going back to the definition of shock wave, we said, shock wave is defined as the transition between any two traffic states. So those two traffic states could be anything. It could be um, from free flow speed to a complete standstill, just like this example we had when the traffic light turns red. So people are going with free flow speed and then they have to stop to, uh, to, to a complete stop. They have to make a complete stop. So that's a transition. Uh, 
also from complete stop to free flow speed, that's another transition. So another shockwave also forms there. Um, and again, in this case, because of the traffic signal, we see a change in the capacity and then uh, that creates some discontinuity in the flow and density and as a result, uh, shock waves uh, form in the traffic stream. And a stationary shock wave here is actually this horizontal line here, parallel to the, um, parallel to the X axis. So remember we said shock wave is a transition from any state, any steady state traffic to another steady state traffic. So it doesn't have to be from this traffic state, let's call it A. So yes, it's a transition from traffic state A to traffic state B. Yes, this is the shock wave. From traffic state B to traffic state C, yes, that's a shock wave. But if we call this traffic state, which is basically nothing, it's nothing there, right? So volume is zero, um, density is zero. So this is the traffic state of this part of the time and space diagram. So the transition from B to D is also a shock wave. And you can see that this shock wave has actually has a, um, has a station, it's a it's an stationary shock wave. Again, we'll see more examples and we'll talk more about this uh, in, the, in, the, in the following slides. So let's um, review some of the things we've learned so far. So shock waves occur when there is a change in the traffic state. That change in the traffic state could either be a change in flow or change in density or change in the speed. Uh, the formation of shock waves happen very gradually at the micro scale. It usually happens when vehicles accelerate or when they brake slowly. And also at the macro scale, it happens when a traffic flow changes slowly over time. Um, but when it comes to analysis of the shock waves, it's, act it's actually very helpful to consider these changes as happening instantaneously. Um, because, uh, for example, in this example that we saw, um, the, the change from traffic state to traffic B is actually very abrupt and instantaneous. I'm not, uh, but in reality, vehicles slow down gradually they do not move from a to b suddenly right so there is a there is a very gradual decrease of speed uh, that we'll see in reality but when it comes to analysis of it uh, for simplification we usually look at it from like an instantaneous change from traffic state a to traffic state b and um, as we defined earlier shock wave appears at the boundary of two steady state traffic conditions and as I highlighted, as we saw in the poll and discussed, uh, uh, shock waves can be either stationary or they could move forward or they could also move backward relative to the direction of uh, traffic. Um, so here is a nice illustration of different classification of shock waves that I'd like to share with you. Um, this is actually a very complete classification guide where we see a time and space diagram and direction of traffic is this way. So in this case, we can actually see some forward moving shock wave. So if a shock wave happens in a time and space diagram with a positive slope. So if we look at these red arrows here, this shock wave is called a forward forming shock wave because it is moving forward and um, the slope is actually positive in the time space diagram. Um, this shock wave here is often called forward recovery because although the slope is positive, but when, when we actually look at the uh, the actual trajectories, we'll see that it's actually helping with the recovery of congestion while the forward forming. So the reason we call it forming versus recovery is because it relates to formation of congestion or recovery of congestion. So for example, let, let me make an example here for you. Uh, going back to that traffic signal example that we had. So we had 
uh, some shock waves going and then suddenly a vehicle has to stop and then it continues. So the one before has to stop and then it goes, has to stop and goes. So there, here is a shock wave. And that is an example of a backward. Is that, so this, you see the slope is negative here, right? So that's a backward shock wave. And is that a forming shock wave or a recovery shock wave? Is that a backward forming or backward recovery shock wave? Here, this is more of a backward forming shock wave. Why? Because, shock, because congestion starts forming. That's why we call it forming. And the direction of the movement of the shock wave is against the traffic, traffic stream. So that's why it's called backward. But the, what about the other shock wave that we saw? So this shock wave is also moving backward against the direction of traffic. The slope is negative in the time and space diagram. But is it forming or recovery? This is more of a recovery shock wave because it's a transition between two traffic states where it helps with the recovery of the congestion. So this was the uh, backward forming. And this shock wave was also backward, but recovery shock wave. And we can actually see a couple of uh, two two other shock waves in this diagram. We can also have a frontal stationary or a rear stationary. So let me tell you more about what is like what is an example of a stationary um, shock wave. Again, this shock wave here, as we talked before right at the location of the signal timing is a stationary shock wave because for example it's a transition between traffic state b to d if as we saw previously it's a stationary shock wave because the slope is zero but is that a frontal stationary or a rear stationary in this case we call that a frontal stationary because it's at the front of the queue so here is where the vehicles have to queue up right and because that is the that is the front of the queue, we call that a frontal stationary. But if the but if the stationary shock wave was at the back of the queue, we would have called it a rear stationary. So before I move on to the uh, next slide showing you how we can actually measure and calculate the speed of the shock waves, let me show you. Um, the significance and relevance of shockwave analysis in, in research, actually. So uh, let me share with you my uh, web browser. So here is a research paper from 2011 from some of our colleagues in the US from Georgia Tech and Arizona State Uni. Um, which looks at um, formation and propagation of shock waves um, um, on freeways. Um, so just want to show you some of some of its figures. Again, I encourage you to read this paper on your own. Um, um, the title is Freeway Traffic Oscillations, Microscopic Analysis of Formations and Propagations Using Wavelet Transform. It's published in Transportation Research Part B. So have a look on your own time. It's not a difficult paper to understand. Um, the method is relatively simple. It has some math behind it, but it's not too complicated. But look, these are the freeways that they were looking at to analyze. So they looked at two different freeways. One was northbound, um, uh, I-80 in California, and the other one was southbound in Los Angeles, California. And this was a this was a section of a freeway uh, with with an on ramp and an off ramp with multiple lanes. And again, it's a it's a typical California highway, right? With six lanes. We don't usually see that many lanes in Australian freeways. Um, but anyways, so if I come down a little bit, so what they've done was they had the data from uh, something like the NGSIM data, database that we talked about before. And you can see the trajectories and the formation of shock waves in, in real world here, where you see all these dark lines that have formed here. These are the real shock waves that have formed and propagated. And if you look closely, you can actually see uh, in this area where uh, they, 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 they drew a circle around it, there is not much, there is no shock wave, right? 
Uh, we'll see a few of lane changing here. These 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 lines that have uh, the discontinuity in the lines that we see in this circle represent the lane change as we discussed before in the previous weeks. But then suddenly, because of a few lane change, we can see after that some shock 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 wave starts actually forming. And again, if if you zoom in into that area, you can actually see that. This line is a representation of the vehicle that was changing lane, and again here as well. And then suddenly, a few vehicles later, a shock wave starts forming, and then it starts propagating backward. Same thing happens multiple times. As soon as a vehicle starts changing lane, you can see here on the right, uh, we have two vehicles changing lane, and then suddenly, two vehicles later, a wave starts forming, we see, we see an oscillation or fluctuation in the speed of the vehicles and that starts propagating backward. In this case, obviously, this is a uh, backward forming shock wave because the congestion is forming and the shock wave is actually moving against the direction of traffic. Same thing here. Again, if you look at the if you look at the plots in this research paper, you see the very similar kind of analysis that you're just learning on the shock wave. This is used for cutting edge research. So I just wanted to show you the relevance of the, 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 the contents that you're actually learning today in, in a state of the art research. Um, so have a look at this paper. It's very uh, it's an interesting paper. It looks with um, it, it works with empirical data, and um, it's actually fun and very educative to uh, read. So now that we learned about different kind of shock waves, let's just start talking about how can we actually measure the speed of the shock wave, how fast this shock wave moves forward or moves back, uh, uh, backward. So um, let's refresh our memory. We, saw, we learned about fundamental diagram in previous lectures. That, so this is the relationship between density and flow, for example. And this is our fundamental diagram, right? How can we get this speed from the fundamental diagram? So if you remember, any traffic state can be represented by a point on the fundamental diagram, right? So let's call this traffic state A, let's call this traffic state B. So traffic state A has the flow of A, QA, and it has the density of A, Traffic state B also has the flow of B and density of B. What would be the question for you is, what is the speed for traffic state A? What is the speed for traffic state B? How can we get the speed from this fundamental diagram? So again, we learned this before in the previous, previous lecture that if we draw a line from the origin to this point A, the slope of this line actually represents the speed. So this slope represents the speed of traffic state A. Same thing with traffic state B. If I draw a line from the origin to this point on the fundamental diagram, the slope of this line represents the speed of traffic state uh, B, right? So again, as I did it here, and now if we if we connect that to the time and space diagram, so previously we saw this was a time, this was a fundamental diagram, and now if you look at the time and space diagram, so this is a time and space diagram, right? What was the slope of the trajectories in a time and space diagram? Yes, speed, velocity, excellent. And interestingly, as we saw in the fundamental diagram, the slope of the line in the fundamental diagram is was also was also representing a speed, right? So there is this very interesting relationship between fundamental diagram FD, let's call it, and the time and space diagram. So the relationship between fundamental diagram and time and space diagram can actually be nicely represented by the slope of the line in each of these diagrams, which interestingly both represent a speed, right? Um, so we, we, we use this property, we use this interesting relationship um, very frequently when it comes to analysis of shock waves and, and, and traffic analysis. So, um, for example, here is a time and space diagram. 
of um, a free wave, let's say, um, where um, at the beginning, there is no interruption in traffic flow and all the trajectories are actually going with a constant speed. You see the slope of the lines are a constant. So vehicles are moving smoothly with a constant speed. So this would be a, a steady state traffic condition, right? So let's call that A, for example. And then suddenly there is a traffic light uh, turning red or there is an, an accident happens. And uh, this vehicle has to slow down and stop for some time until the traffic light either turns green or the incident is removed from the road. And then the vehicle can again speed up and continue. So the vehicles that have queued up behind this first vehicle is also called a uh, platoon. So we call this a platoon of vehicles uh, has actually formed behind that lead vehicle. And again, as we saw uh, earlier and discussed, as soon as the traffic light turns green, uh, all these vehicles will have the opportunity to speed up and then um, uh, continue their, their movement ahead. So this was traffic state A, this was traffic state B, and this could be represented as traffic state C, right? So um, I think I briefly touched on this. So uh, let's say traffic state A, traffic state B, traffic state C. And as I said earlier, this void area in the time and space diagram where there's no vehicle, then Q is zero and density is also zero, can also be represented as a city state traffic um, condition, right? Um, and again, as we learned before, the speed has an inverse relationship with the headway, flow has an inverse relationship, sorry, uh, density has a relationship, has an inverse relationship with the spacing, flow has an inverse relationship with headway. So this was density, this was a spacing, if you remember, Q is flow and this is headway. So spacing was the vertical distance between two trajectories and headway was the horizontal distance between two trajectories, right? And if I draw the line representing the boundary between these traffic states, so we can see there is, I can draw a line representing the boundary between traffic state A and B. I can draw a line between uh, B and C. I can draw a line between B and D. I can draw a line between actually A and D from D to from D to C. And again, if there was another, um, if this was also, if if I have drawn the trajectories here, this could be the continuation of traffic state A here. So there is also a transition from C to A, which can be drawn as a line. So all of these lines in red that I have drawn on the boundary between these these steady state regions are actually shock wave. So how many shock waves do we see here in this time space diagram? We see one, two, three, four, five, six. We actually see, see six different shock waves. So um, let me pose a question for you here. Um, what is, can somebody help me with classifying what is the shock wave between A and D, this shock wave. Is this a forward moving shock wave or a backward moving shock wave? So this shock wave here um, from A to D, so this shock wave here, that goes from A to D. So let's call it WAD. Is that a forward moving shock wave or a backward moving shock wave? Everybody agree that this is a forward moving shock wave? 
That's correct, Inning. That's a move. That's a forward moving shock wave. Why? Because we can see, remember, if I go back to the classification of the shock wave, if the slope of the shock wave in the time and space diagram is positive, that's a forward moving shock wave. If the slope is negative, that's a backward moving shock wave. And then we discussed about the difference between forming and recovery, which we're going to talk about in a second. So, so from A to D is actually, if I make this full screen again, so WAD is actually a forward moving, is that a recovery shock wave or a forming shock wave? Do we see congestion forming because of this shock wave or do we see actually um, congestion is actually recovering because of this shock wave. Because traffic state A has a little bit of traffic and traffic state D actually has no traffic. So a transition from A to D can be considered a recovery shock wave because uh, we're moving from higher density to lower density. So this would be a forward recovery. What about D to C? So the shock wave, the transition from D to C, is that a forward moving or a backward moving? The slope is positive. So this is also another forward moving shock wave. But because we're going from a low density to a high density, so basically traffic congestion is forming, so that would be a forward moving, forward forming shock wave. Let's have a look at the shock wave from A to B. So WAB, is that a backward shock wave, backward moving shock wave or a forward moving shock wave? That's a backward moving shock wave because the slope is negative. And is that forming or recovery? We're going from high speed to a very low speed, right? So speed is high here, speed is very low here, it's actually zero here. So the here is relatively uncongested and inside this triangle is very congested. So it's a forming shock wave. So this is called a backward forming shock wave. What about the shock wave from B to C? So B to C is actually also a backward moving, but is that recovery or forming? It's actually a recovery shock wave, right? Because we are, we are going from a complete stop behind the signal to a relatively high speed. So congestion is actually recovering here. So it would be a backward recovery shock wave. We also have this last shock wave here from C to A, where um, the speed is high here. Actually, density is very high here. It's at, it's at capacity. And then um, density is a slightly lower here. So this is also a forward forming shock wave. So if you want to have a look at it from a different perspective, so again, this is the same time and space diagram, um, same six shock waves, four different traffic states, A, B, and C, D. And if at this time T, if I look at the road from the sky, what would I see? So here is the here is the section of the road that I'm looking at at this time. If I fly over the over over this section of the road at t t t uh, time equal t, what would I see? So look, I draw a line at this different locations on the road. So when I draw when I fly on top of the road. This part of the road here, 
right? This part of the road is the continuation of this traffic estate A, right? So this is traffic estate A. I'll see some vehicles moving forward, right? Which represent this part. This part of the road that I'm looking at at this time is void. There's no vehicle in it, right? So if I take a picture of the road at that time, this part of the road is totally empty with Q equals zero, K equals zero. And that's traffic state D. And here is where this traffic signal is located, right? And then this part of the road, I'll see vehicles have queued up. So here is V equals zero. Vehicles are totally stopped. And then I'll see another shock wave here and then this part is actually traffic state A, right? So I'll see vehicles are slowing down and they're joining the queue. So if I keep taking pictures like that at T equal T1, at T equal T2, T equal T3, T3, what I would see, I would actually see the movement of these shock waves. So remember, what was this shock wave? This shock wave was representing this transition between A and B. So this was transition between A and B. This is transition between B and D. And this is transition between D and A, right? So A, B shock wave was a backward moving shock wave. So what I, would, what I would expect to see in the footage that I'm taking from the sky is that this shock wave is actually moving backward because this vehicle moves forward. It, it joins the queue. So this shock wave moves here. Then the next vehicle joins the queue, this shock wave moves here. So in this shock wave keeps moving backward and the length of the queue keeps increasing, right? Until we hit this point here where the two shock waves intersect when the shock wave AB intersects with, intersects with the shock wave BC. And that's the point where the queue is actually dissipating entirely because we see then there's no vehicles stopping. The vehicles after that time can actually freely continue with whatever speed uh, they had uh, before, right? I think I talked about this. So this was a, um, a stationary shock wave as I talked about. This shock wave is actually a forward moving shock wave. Again, if you take a footage from the sky, you'll see that this shock wave is actually a start uh, moving uh, in the direction of the traffic. This shock wave will be a stationary because that's the location of the traffic signal. And then this shock wave would be a backward moving shock wave moving against the direction of the traffic. So uh, before I continue, uh, let's do a little class activity here. So remember this, um, traffic simulation that I shared with you uh, in the previous lectures. Uh, let's click on the ring simulation and let's make it a single lane ring road. Very similar to that video that we saw uh, earlier in the class. Uh, let's make the truck percentage to zero so there's no truck on the road. We only have vehicles uh, with a density of 30 vehicles per kilometer. And as you can see, there's no congestion at the moment, right? But gradually, if we wait maybe a minute or two, we'll see uh, congestion form. Yep, yeah, there you go. Very similar to that ring road experiment that we saw. We are actually seeing the exact phenomena happening in simulation because the way the car following model is coded here, it allows imperfection in the simulation. So vehicles, although they are supposed to go with the uh, free flow speed of 80 kilometers or 70 kilometers per hour, but there is some variation between this. And, and look, the shock wave is moving backward here. Um, so look, look, look at this shock wave here that is moving against the direction of traffic. So that is a backward forming shock wave, a transition from congested state, uh, a transition from free flow speed to the congestion state. And, and look at the front of the queue. This is also another shock wave, another shock wave that all that that is also moving backward, but because it's 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 helping with the recovery of congestion, it's a backward moving 
uh, recovery shockwave, while the one in the back of the queue was a backward forming shockwave. So you can see in this example, again, this is very similar to what I talked before that uh, imagine we are, we, are, we, are, we are flying on top of the road and we are taking footage of the road. So how many shock waves are we seeing here? And the correct answer is actually two shock waves. We do not have a stationary shock wave here. Uh, so let's have a look at this um, example again. Uh, Where's my browser? It's here. So look, let's just start again. At the beginning, there is no shock wave. Vehicles are moving with the constant speed and they're all going 65 kilometer per hour. You can see there are two there are loop detectors on four locations on the ring, and that gives you the speed and flow. But after a couple of seconds, because of that imperfection of driver behavior, we'll start seeing some, yes, you see the color of the vehicles are start changing to green and yellowish a little bit. That's where the congestion is to start forming. Yes, so now I see a shockwave is forming. Yes, so shockwave has started forming. It is now propagating. So look at the end of the queue. Look at the back of the queue. The shockwave is backward moving, right? So a backward forming shockwave is happening. So this is one shockwave. And there's also another shockwave in front of the queue, transition from the congested state to uncongested state. So that's a backward recovery shock wave, and that's it. There is no other shock wave in this example. We do not have a, a stationary shock wave. How about what I would like you to do is I would like you to drag. You see, you can just take this signal and uh, let me actually refresh my, uh, I, I click on this and I restart the simulation. I'm going to put a traffic light here. If I click on it, I make it green. And then if I click on it, I make it red, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to create this single lane ring road simulation on your computers, drag a traffic light and put it on the ring and then observe what you see. Try to detect the shock waves, try to identify the shock waves and classify them, whether they are stationary, whether they are moving backward or whether they're moving forward. Um, and then we can uh, talk about it. So I'm gonna give you a minute uh, to go to this link that I shared in the chat box, traffic-simulation.de slash ring.html. Uh, so create this little ring experiment. And again, if you want to, if I drag this out of the ring, uh, I remove the traffic light. So what I want you is add the traffic light. Uh, you can you can make the percentage of the truck to zero. Keep the density as 30 vehicle per kilom per kilometer. Um, and let's see what will happen. So again, if I restart it, let's have a look at an example here. I hope it becomes a bit more clear in, a, in an example in my slides. Uh, so remember this time and space diagram and the trajectories that we discussed. Uh, we identified six different shock waves in this time and space diagram. And we can actually map each shock wave into the, on the fundamental diagram. So this was traffic state A, this was traffic state B, traffic state C, and traffic state D. If I map each of these traffic states on the fundamental diagram, what would I see? So traffic state A is near capacity, so it's somewhere around here, let's say. The actual numbers don't matter here. C let's say that's at capacity. Traffic estate B, where is traffic estate B? Traffic estate B is totally congested. So that's actually jam density. Here is jam density, right? Because flow is zero, everybody's stopped. So this is B. And what about D, where is D? D is Q equals zero, K equals zero. So it's actually here. 
right? So now if I want to map the shock waves on the fundamental diagram, I only need to connect the transition line between these trapping states. So for example, the transition from A to D is actually happening here. So that's the shock wave from A to D. Shock wave from A to B is actually here. Shock wave from B to D is here. Shock wave B to C is here. We also have a C to A here, right? Uh, we also have a D to C. Yep, so these are all the shock waves that I could map on the fundamental diagram. And what would be the speed of the shock waves? So the speed of the shock wave is actually the speed of these lines. So remember we said there's an interesting relationship between the fundamental diagram and the time and space diagram. The slope of a line in each of them represents the speed. So either speed of the trajectory or speed of the shock wave. So for look at the look at the shock wave, the transition between A to B. So the slope of this line, the slope of this shock wave is simply the slope of the, 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 the speed of this shock wave is simply the slope of the this line in the time and space diagram. This is the same line in the fundamental diagram. Look, there is A to B. So this is shock wave A to B. So this same line will have the same slope. So if I calculate the slope of this line, that would give me the speed of the shock wave. So let's calculate it. I would say the speed of shock wave A to B, because it's transitioned from A to B, so we say from A to B, it would be QA minus QB over KA minus KB. Why? The slope of the line here, look, so this is QA, this is KA, this is QB and KB, right? So the slope of, again, look, remember the triangles we said, the slope of the line is a rise over run. So this is the rise, the rise is QA minus QB. So this is rise over run in that triangle. And the, and the run is KA minus KB. In this case, in this specific case, QB is zero, right? KB is KJ. So the speed of the shock wave here would simply be the flow of traffic state A over KA minus KJ. Is that a positive or negative value? Again, from the slope, we can see it's negative, right? And here you can also confirm. So QA is positive. KJ is the maximum density that the traffic state can have. So the denominator will all here, in this case, the denominator has to be negative because KA is a smaller than KJ, right? Look, look, KA is actually here. K, KB, which is equal to KJ, is here. So KJ is larger than KA. So denominator is negative. So it would be positive divided by negative. So this speed of shock wave is negative. And it's a backward moving shock wave. So this is how we actually map the shock waves from time and space diagram on the fundamental diagram. And we can calculate and measure the speed of the shock wave. So let's have a look at another example here. Imagine you're going, imagine we have a transition from A to B here. So A is, is from, is within the uncongested regime and B is congested regime, right? Remember in the fundamental diagram, if we have this critical density and we have this capacity, whatever that, is on the left side is uncongested, whatever that is right side is called congested. So again, if I connect these two traffic state A and B with a straight line, uh, and if I calculate the um, slope of that line, uh, that would give me the speed of the shock wave. So it would be QA minus QB over KA minus KB. So this gives me the slope of the 
line and which is equal to the shock wave. And in this case, is that a forward moving shock wave or a backward moving shock wave? It is forward moving shock wave, yes. Uh, because the slope of the line is positive, that means uh, the shock wave is actually uh, moving forward. So, um, how about this one? If this is traffic state A, this is traffic state B. So I have QA here, I have KA here, I have QB here, I have KB here, actually not there. So the speed of, so this would represent the shock wave and the speed of the shock wave is QA minus QB over KA minus KB. So, and would that be a positive value or a negative value? Is this a backward moving shock wave or a forward moving shock wave? So here's the, here's the numerical example. So let's go over this numerical example quickly. And then, um, so the problem is giving us a scenario where we see a stretch of a highway with multiple traffic states, as we saw before. And now what we're doing simply here is we're, we're putting some numbers. So this is traffic state A, the speed is, uh, so the speed is uh, 50 kilometer per hour for uh, state A, density is 15 vehicle per kilometer, and QA is actually 750 vehicle per hour. Um, and state traffic B, um, is speed is zero kilometer per hour, flow is zero, and it is at a jam density, 150 vehicle per kilometer. Um, and we also have the free flow speed, the jam density, and the capacity. So basically, if I want to draw the fundamental diagram, um, this would be K, this would be Q, uh, this is K, J, which is 150, capacity is 2,250. And um, so that would be the fundamental diagram, right? Where is traffic state A? Let's find traffic state A on the fundamental diagram. So it says K is equal to 15. So this is 15. Uh, Q is 750, so traffic state A is somewhere here, right? And traffic state B, where is traffic state B? Traffic state B is at jam density, so that is traffic state B. So if I want to draw, calculate the shock wave, this would be the shock wave between A and B. So if I want to calculate the speed of the shock wave, the transition from A to B, it would simply be QA minus QB over KA minus KB. So in this case, QA is 750, QB is 0, over KA is 15, and KB is actually the jam density, which is 115. So if I um, calculate uh, the speed of the shock wave here. Let me calculate that. So this is 1 minus 35. So it is simply 1, uh, 750 divided by minus 175, which gives me minus 5.5 kilometer per hour. So it's a negative shock wave with the speed of five kilometer per hour. Remember in the simulation, we saw that the shock wave is actually moving backward against the traffic direction. This five kilometer per hour is actually the speed there. So where the shock wave is actually moving backward, 
with that five kilometer per hour speed. So every hour, the shock valve will, move, will propagate against the traffic direction 5.5 kilometer. And that's usually the actual range of uh, shock waves, if you want to have something in mind. So shock waves is usually either five kilometer per hour, seven, sometimes 10. Again, it really depends on the density of the road, uh, density on uh, the density, um, but that's usually uh, like the range that the, the usual range that we observe uh, in reality. We can also calculate the speed uh, of the shock wave, uh, the transition from B to C. So again, uh, if I want to do shock wave a speed of B to C, that would be QB minus QC over KB minus KC. Uh, QB is zero, right? Because that's a jam density. What is QC? QC, we said it at capacity. So if I plot the fundamental diagram here, let's try to map it on the fundamental diagram. That makes it a lot easier. So this was B with KJ. KJ was 150. And this is 2250, that is uh, Q capacity, right? This is given in the problem. I want to know what is uh, what is the state of uh, this, the, the, the traffic state C here. So C, I guess we said it's actually at the capacity. So this is C here. I want to know what is its uh, K. In this case, if we assume this fundamental diagram is following the Green Shields model, remember the Green Shields model we talked about before? In the Green Shields model, we knew that Kc is equal to half of Kj, and the, the speed at capacity is also half of the free flow speed. Remember, these are the, the interesting and nice properties of the Green Shields model. So in this case, Kc is actually half of Kj. So if I want to calculate the shock wave speed here, it would be 0 minus 2250 divided by Kb, which is jam density 150, minus half of 150, which is 75. And that gives me the... Uh, the shock wave speed, which is minus 30 kilometer per hour. I mean, this is a very large speed for, for shock waves. Um, I don't think if we necessarily see that large uh, of a shock wave speed in reality uh, using some empirical data. But again, in this example, let's go with this. But, but this is how we calculate. And again, this is also a backward moving shock wave. So that's why it's a minus 30 kilometer per hour. Uh, similarly, we can calculate um, the other shock waves from A to C, A to B, B to C. So there's nothing uh, difficult about calculating different shock waves as long as we have the traffic states K, Q, and speed at any, at any point on the fundamental diagram. But let's now step back and revisit the phantom traffic jam video that we saw. So. In that video, we, we learned that the small variations in the speed of the drivers because of the driver behavior imperfection could actually magnify and amplify, and it becomes a large uh, traffic jam. So let's let's see what will happen. But but again, there was one condition that there is there should be enough cars on the road. So let's say, what does that mean? Having enough car on the road could mean that we have, we are at capacity, right? So imagine we are near capacity. Imagine this is my capacity. So this is the K critical, and this is the capacity. So at one time, I'm at traffic state A, and suddenly somebody slows down and we go to traffic state B. So you see, the flows are very close, but because we see the transition from one steady state traffic condition to another traffic state, uh, steady state traffic conditions, we still see a shock wave forming, right? 
And that shock wave is actually pretty small because the slope of this line is very small, right? You see, it's almost horizontal. If it was perfectly horizontal, that's actually no shock wave, right? It's a, uh, it's a zero, it's zero. Uh, there is a shock wave, actually it's, it's with the zero speed, so it doesn't propagate. Um, so if we had this uh, QA and KA for this traffic state, and if we had QB and KB for this traffic state, we could easily calculate the speed of the shock wave, which is QA minus QB over KA minus KB. Uh, and that would, again, in this case, it's very close to zero. So it doesn't necessarily propagate. It's kind of an stationary. But if these traffic states start, uh, if, for example, if the traffic state B starts going downward, into the congested regime. Imagine traffic state B comes here after some point. Then there's no, it's no longer traffic state B, right? So let's call it C. Then we can see that this shock wave actually starts, the slope of the shock wave gradually starts increasing. And that's where, and again, because it's negative, that's what we saw in the, in the phantom traffic jam video where um, the slope of the line, the slope of the, the slope of the, the shock wave starts propagating and it becomes a major thing, it becomes a major interruption um, in traffic. So a small shock waves, a small transitions could simply um, magnify and create large traffic jams.